Lord, may we hear you call us by name. May we hear your voice at this time. Amen. Please be seated. So we have this random, it seems, teaching about sheep and shepherds from Jesus. And I just want to remind you, the sixth word of that gospel reading was very truly, I tell you, Pharisees. We must realize he was talking directly to the Pharisees. And perhaps, and perhaps we need to ask ourselves why. Some people, Some people think, think that, that chapter 9 and chapter 10, 10 of the Gospels should, should not have been separated, separated into these. separate chapters. Because chapter 9 is about the healing of the blind man. One of the miracles John puts into his Gospel in order to point towards this Jesus who gives life and life in its fullness. In fact, John's Gospel, as you probably know, ends with these words, I have come that you may have life in his name. So Jesus heals this blind man, and the reaction of the Pharisees reveals the actions of what Jesus then describes as thieves and robbers. They go to Jesus and they talk about him and they say, this man does not even keep the Sabbath. Perhaps worse, they then say to him, how can a sinner do this? They even go to the blind man's parents and say, let's just check up. Was he actually blind or is this just a charade? And then they say to this healed man, Actually, you just one of this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. And then, as if your origins truly count, we don't even know where this man comes from. How dare you lecture us? So the Pharisees, the very people who were supposed to be the shepherds, were reacting in this way towards this marvelous occurrence. I can now see. And Jesus pens the words, not pens, it speaks the words of chapter 10 directly to them in response to how they were. And they would have been under no illusion that when Jesus started picking up the analogy of sheep and sheepfolds and gates and shepherds, that Jesus was drawing their attention to a piece of Scripture that they knew very well. And that is our Old Testament reading for today, Ezekiel chapter 34, where it is prophesied in some detail how the shepherds at that time are failing and that God will become their shepherd. And as it was being read today, that Ezekiel, I thought to myself, not much seems to have changed. And it's interesting also to me that he uses the word thieves and robbers, the distinction between those who simply pilfer and take and robbers who use violence. He was making a very, very strong point. And Jesus says to him, this is who you are, but I am the shepherd and then he uses that phrase that we truly love, where he says, I have come to have, that they may have life and have it in all its fullness. And the various translations of the Bible express that slightly differently. I have come to have life and have it in all its abundance. And we like that, that uh, verse. But I wonder if you've truly ever really thought about what it means. We can interpret it in many ways. The prosperity churches may interpret it as saying, well, 
He's come that we may have abundance. We may say, well, if our lives aren't going what we feel is in the correct way and we don't feel fulfilled, uh, then we haven't got this fullness or this abundance and so we must be doing something wrong. But when we are, we think, oh, I'm enjoying life in all its fullness. Well, every single one of us knows that life ain't like that. Life is a roller coaster ride. I know that Facebook sometimes puts up these cartoons which says how life was supposed to be and how life is. <laughs> you know, that's how it, how it is. And as I was thinking about this, I thought to myself, what does this fullness of life mean? Can it? And then I said, even should it mean that our lives are devoid of pain and suffering? Our psalm, after all, refers to walking through the valley of the shadow of death, not circumnavigating it. Thy rod and thy staff, in our psalm, talks about being pulled and prodded by the shepherd's crook. Perhaps some of the clergy need to remember that when the bishop has to wield that rod and staff. Being pulled in the right direction. Somehow comforting always. But never always totally comfortable. Comforting and comfortable. But what struck me for the first time more loudly than ever was how Jesus emphasizes the voice. Now I don't know about you when you go shopping with your loved ones. I get separated from Sharon frequently. In fact, every time. Why is not important because she's not here to defend herself. But when I want to find out where she is, knowing that she is somewhere in Woolies. I just go, Ooh. and she appears because she knows that sound means I'm there. We have the sound, and I suppose some people may look at them and say, well, that's a bit odd, but most people don't even hear it. Our voices, our particular tones are recognized, aren't they? They are recognized. So let me tell you a story that happened to a man who eventually became a bishop. He was a small child living in a village near, I think it was Kolocha. It might have been Kluunu, but I'm choosing the one that I can pronounce. It was a ring of round rondavel huts, and at the top, a square house where the head of the household lived. And all of these huts around in this ring were for gogos and aunties and children and visitors and uncles, etc. And in between, as you can probably visualize, there was a, uh, a clearing, smooth clearing, well trod by feet, no vegetation, and a fire in the middle. And on the side, slightly set back, were the ablutions of this household. And as the night began to take its hold, the light would go and the paraffin lamps in the huts would slowly, one by one, be extinguished until, if it was a moonless night, there would be pitch darkness. And then, he said, the children would become scared because if they wanted to go to the loo, they had to go out into the darkness. And of course, being kids, bed at eight, I need to go to the loo at ten. They would go out faced by darkness and that fire in the middle, as you would know, sometimes makes it worse. The contrast between the light and the darkness makes it even more scary. But he says always, and he never, he didn't try to explain why, always there was a gogo still awake. And that gogo would say, I can see you. I can see you. And he said that while he was being called by his name, and while 
he was being told he can be seen. The darkness he was walking into was irrelevant. He was safe because he was being seen. And that he could hear that he was being seen. And he would walk through. And when he came back, I can see you still. Until he got back to his bed. Isn't that how God is with us? Through all of life, and particularly through those dark times, he's saying, Angus, I can see you. Calling you by name. And just letting you know that you are within the compass of his vision always. It's a wonderful voice. But of course there's another tone of voice, and it's confession time here. Being the strapping lad that I was, Tony, be quiet. Uh, I was invited when I was in the Defense Force for my service to the Rodin Matric Dance. Stud. <laughs> and during that dance, my partner, her name was Alison, persuaded me against my better judgment to try and breach the perimeter for a romantic talk, a romantic walk. I thought that this was a bit risky, but she was persuasive. And within about three millimeters of penetrating the darkness and the shrubs, a soft but extremely loud voice said, Alison, where do you think you're going? We did have success later on, by the way, naughty girl that she was. We also have him saying to us, Angus, I can see you, if we're listening. Angus, I can see you. In fact, I can see you. The different inflections of that are important because it's the same voice, and it's funny how at the time when we are being disobedient, it's a little bit worrying and makes us feel awkward. But that's not meaning that it's not comforting. The contrast between the Pharisees and Jesus can perhaps be summed up by saying, the Pharisees, as you can see from their interaction about the blind man, were about laws without love, whereas Jesus was about love without laws. And if you love properly, you do not need the laws as is taught throughout the New Testament. That shepherd, either with crook or rod or staff or voice, calls the flock through the door when protection is needed and closes in on them. And that reading from Acts is not, I don't think, intended to be a picture about how we should all be today. It's a snapshot, a photograph of how they were living at that time, new, fresh, and some of them had even experienced the voice in flesh. And there they were, they'd been called together. Notice that they're not meeting secretly in the upper room anymore. They're meeting in the temple courts, 3,000 of them at a time, hearing that voice. It really is about that voice. I read somewhere, and I'm not sure where, that handles water music, and I'm sure that you can start to hear the tune playing in your mind, had a fascinating construction. As you know, I'm sure, the king and his entourage were on a barge going up the Thames, and the orchestra was on another barge instructed to play for them. I can't remember what the the occasion was, but it was a grand occasion. But if you watch the boat races on the Thames, that river is not as predictable as you think, and the boats separate. And this would have been practiced. And Handel would have realized that as you're going along at this pace at that time, the orchestra and the king would have been separated. And I've heard that his, hand, his water music was constructed with crescendos at that particular time so that the orchestra would continue to be heard. Isn't God like that with us as well? The further we meander away, the louder he's trying to call us. 
Any parent would remember that. It is this following of this voice, this hearing of the voice through all the ups and downs of our life, which I believe speaks to what I think is this fullness of life. That when life throws at us all those ups and downs, we still can hear His voice. That's living. That is life. We don't have to pretend to be averse to suffering and pain, our own and others. But we must certainly not become blasé about our comforts and our blessings. We must still hear the Lord's voice during those times. That is living when we are able to exhibit all of those things that we are given as human beings through all the changing scenes of our life. So far from being living in a protected bubble of good life, it's about being able to hear. Angus, I can see you. Angus, I can see you. Angus, I can see you. Amen.